Let's pray. Father God, we come before you in thanksgiving for everything that you do. I just thank you for this class and the fact that we're here to study your word and go verse by verse through the book of Isaiah. And I pray, Lord, even our lesson today is going to be a sense of encouragement to all of us because your word gives us a great future. And we're going to learn about that even as we look into this 55th chapter of Isaiah. But I want to lift Karen before you right now, Lord, and uh, we know that uh, she's going through a very difficult time with her cancer. I'm going to pray for remission, that's what she's requested, but she's also said that when her time's up, she's ready to go and be with the Lord, and we love that kind of spirit as well. I pray for the Mellers as they recuperate from COVID, and anybody else, Lord, whom we may not know from this class that's not been well i pray god that you would especially uh, minister to them so honor god the teaching of your word today i pray in jesus name amen so we're going to talk about your invitation sent from god and it's uh, the idea, come to my festival of grace. That's what this chapter is all about. As a pastor, uh, I had a church tradition of always offering a gospel invitation at the end of my sermon. I would invite people who did not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior to come forward and accept him. And I would always ask them the question, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and have you accepted him as the Lord and Savior of your life? Of course, they should respond yes. And then we made arrangements for them to be baptized. We also put them into a very short discipleship program where we wanted them to understand what it really means to be a Christian and the decision which they made. And so that's how I handled things when I was a pastor. Billy Graham was famous for his gospel invitations as the crusade crowd sang. Remember this song? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come. I come. The Billy Graham Association states that more than 3.2 million people came to Christ worldwide through the Billy Graham Crusades. He conducted crusades in 185 nations beginning in 1947 when he held his first crusade in Los Angeles to 19, uh, rather to 2005 when he held his last crusade in New York City. In our text today, Isaiah chapter 55, we see where the prophet is offering an invitation to the Jewish people to call upon the Lord and be saved. Our purpose is to offer the same invitation as we apply Isaiah's message to the church. This invitation is the greatest invitation anyone can ever receive. And there are three invitations that are outlined in our text. First of all, there's the invitation to come to the feast. Then there's the invitation to call upon the Lord. And there's the invitation to celebrate with singing. So, there's your outline. Now let's get into the chapter. Notice the first five verses. Come to the feast. In verses one and two, you discover the delicacies from God are free. In other words, God is throwing a feast. And everything that he's offering is free, he says. Notice, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. You who have no money, come and buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. So the Lord is offering an invitation. Come. Three times in this first verse, we are invited to come. 
The invitation is for those who are spiritually thirsty and hungry, for those who are spiritually impoverished, and for those who spend their wages on that which does not satisfy. The invitation to the Lord's banquet is without cost. The price has already been paid as you buy wine and milk without money and without price. The banquet that God has prepared for us is totally free. Why? Jesus paid it all. We are invited to come and freely partake in Him. Now, we ask, how does this apply to the Jews in Isaiah's day? Here's a question that's often asked, so let's bring an answer to it. What we're really asking is, how about those who lived before the time of Jesus and His death on the cross? How do those individuals get saved? Well, when Jesus shed his blood, he did so for the sins of all mankind throughout history. From Adam to the last person to be born on earth. The people in Isaiah's day were to look forward in faith to their coming Messiah. And this redemptive work prophesied by the apostles. We who live on this side of the cross are to look forward. Uh, backward in faith to his redemptive work. And while the word grace is not an Old Testament term, nonetheless, the grace of God is abundant on both sides of the cross. I want you to understand this now. So let me just give it a little different words. The people who lived before the cross, they were to look forward to what the Messiah was going to do in his death on the cross because the prophets prophesied when the Messiah came, he would die, he would be buried, and he would rise again from the dead. And so those who believed the message of the prophets were declared righteous. We live on this side of the cross, so we look back in faith and receive what Jesus Christ has done for us in his death on the cross. So the grace of God, this is the point, is abundant on both sides of the cross. Everything that God does for us is an act of His grace. Grace is a theme found only in Christianity. Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, and so on know nothing about grace. It is not in their holy books. It is only in the scriptures of the church that we read such a verse as, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. And so since this is a chapter about grace, even though the word grace is not even mentioned, we need to ask ourselves, what is grace? And I think it's well defined in this acronym. God's riches at Christ's expense. So while Isaiah never mentioned the word grace, yet everything in chapter 55 speaks of grace. He tells us that to receive God's grace, one must accept his invitation to come. This is a decision that everyone must make to accept his invitation or reject it. But the invitation is offered to all. Now here's the problem that we get into. There is a debate among theologians on whether or not one can come to Jesus. There is a theology called Calvinism, which is part of Reformed theology that teaches man is totally depraved, dead in his trespasses and sins. It teaches that God is sovereign and that man can do nothing good. Therefore, it would be impossible for a person to come to Christ on his own volition. So from the foundation of the world, God has elected or chosen to save those whom he has chosen to save. This choice is not based on the will of man, but on the will of God. I remember Pastor John MacArthur, a Reformed theologian, being asked, does man have free will? Listen to his answer. Yes, as much free will as a man has in an eight-foot square jail cell. Now, if what MacArthur is saying is true, then God has to take responsibility for most or all of the sin and evil 
in the world. My act of sinning would not be a decision I made since I don't have free will. But the result of what God programmed into me. This is not a good start with a new microphone. Where did it go? Oh. <laughs> In my hand. Already the devil didn't like what I'm talking about. Him. Okay. Let me go back here and let's understand what John MacArthur was saying here. So we'll just repeat ourselves. He says, man has as much free will as a man in an eight-foot square jail cell. So, if what MacArthur is saying is true, understand, then God has to take responsibility for most or all the sin and evil in the world. My act of sin would not be a decision I made since I don't have free will, but the result of what God programmed into me. This makes God an unholy God. And that he is clearly not. John Follett, a notary in the city of Geneva where Calvin lived, criticized Calvin's view of predestination for making God the author of sin. It has always seemed strange to me that I have limited free will in the mundane things of life. What am I going to eat at the restaurant? Or what clothes am I going to wear today? Or what car am I going to purchase? Yet I have no free will in the most important decision in all of life, and that is, where will I spend eternity? If one has no free will, and everything is pre-programmed by God, then it becomes impossible to love God. Yet he makes that a requirement to be saved. Love has to come from the heart. Jesus said we are to love God with all of our heart and soul and mind. To do so, love has to be a personal decision. Otherwise, we are nothing more than puppets and God is up there in heaven pulling the strings. Or we are nothing more than robots and God is pushing the buttons. The notion that God would pick and choose those whom he saves it's called determinism. And that is so against the invitation of Christ who comes knocking at the door of people's hearts. We are not questioning the truth that man cannot accept Christ apart from the wooing of the Holy Spirit as he will convict the world of sin. It is true that we cannot believe in who Jesus is apart from the Holy Spirit. For it is he who testifies concerning Jesus. Even our ability to believe in Jesus and to call him Lord is the work of the Holy Spirit. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse. No one can say Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit, Paul writes. Furthermore, repentance of sin is only possible through the Holy Spirit. Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit on the life of the unbeliever, it would be impossible for that person to come to Christ. Yet in spite of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, let's uh, kind of review here what we've just talked about since uh, we've had this problem develop. What we're saying is repentance of sin is only possible through the Holy Spirit. You see that in Acts and a couple of times in 2 Timothy? Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit and the life of the unbeliever, it would be impossible for that person to come to Christ. Yet in spite of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, this, this, this is the key. In spite of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, man does not lose his free will. Understand that? He can still resist the Holy Spirit. As Stephen said to the Jewish leaders who ultimately stoned him to death, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always, get this, you always resist 
the Holy Spirit. No one can become a Christian apart from the work of the Holy Spirit working on that unbeliever. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us the opportunity to believe in who Jesus is. It's the Holy Spirit who enables us to repent of sin, something we cannot do because we are dead to sin. It takes the Holy Spirit to quicken us so that we can believe, we can repent, but the Holy Spirit doesn't grab a hold of any of us by the hair of the head and force us to believe. He wouldn't have much hair to grab with me. Anyway. You can resist the Holy Spirit. Yes, man has total free will and God is calling us to come. Come. He's pleading with both Jew and Gentile to accept his invitation to come to his banqueting table. It was Jesus who said, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. John, in closing off the book of Revelation, said, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life free. <laughs> the invitation to God's festival of grace has been extended to all mankind. So we're talking about come to the feast. That's the, that's the uh, invitation that's being offered here. And we need to discover when we come that God's delicacies, everything that God is offering at this feast is absolutely free because God is a God of grace. Now notice, delight your soul in God's abundance. That's the latter part of verse 2. And let your soul delight itself in abundance. When we come to the Lord's banqueting table, there is such abundance before us that we will be filled and totally satisfied. Isaiah speaks of this satisfaction in three ways. Here it is. Number one, there will be the satisfaction of the soul. Notice he says, verse two, listen carefully to me, says the Lord, and eat what is good and let your soul delight in abundance. People today try to find their satisfaction in the things of the world. However, money and material toys bring only moment, uh, momentary euphoria and lasting satisfaction. Isaiah has just confirmed that by asking, Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? That's the question Isaiah has been asking. Solomon echoed this thought. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. True contentment and satisfaction in life is found only in a deep relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist wrote this, For he, that is the Lord, satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Again, he said, And whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Again, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Paul wrote, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Folks, that's true satisfaction. Notice next. We're talking about the delights in God's abundance. There will be the sureness of an everlasting covenant. This is verses 3 and 4. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Again, we have another invitation to come. Notice he says there in verse 3, come to me. 
Come to the Lord. Come and enter into an everlasting covenant that God made with David. What was that covenant? David was not permitted to build a temple for the Lord because he had too much blood on his hands. Yet God made an everlasting covenant with David where the Lord said to him, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. It should be a small H there, I believe. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's a reference to his son Solomon. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. It was through the seed of David that the Messiah would come. He would not only save mankind from their sins, but he will set up an everlasting kingdom that shall never come to an end. In Christ you can find satisfaction for your soul right now. But there will be even greater satisfaction that is to come. And you're going to hear about that as we go through this chapter. We can be satisfied now. But oh, I'll tell you, what's, looking, what's ahead for us is even a greater satisfaction. We all have a tremendous future where we will live and reign with Christ in his kingdom, which shall be established forever. That is what the Davidic covenant is all about. Eternal satisfaction with the Lord in his eternal kingdom. Because through the seed of David, the Messiah came, and the Messiah is going to come back and establish a kingdom on earth. But evidently, or eventually rather, it's going to be an eternal kingdom because following the millennial reign, eternity begins. And we're going to be a part of all of that. Notice thirdly, we're talking about the delight in God's abundance here. There will be the summoning of the Gentile nations to be part of Christ's kingdom. Surely, this is verse 5 now, surely you shall call a nation you do not know. So here's a nation that the Jews uh, wouldn't want anything to do with. That would be the Gentiles. And nations who do not know you shall run to you. Now the Gentiles are going to come to the Jews. Because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. Yes, we Gentiles are part of the Davidic covenant. God not only through the seed of David wants to bring lasting satisfaction to the Jews. But to us Gentiles as well. What Isaiah is talking about was fulfilled in the early Jewish church when they were calling Gentiles into the kingdom. The Gentiles were eager to hear the gospel because they learned about a God who loved them enough to die for them. They were also witness to the staunch faith of Jewish believers like Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Then the apostle Paul and all the persecution that he endured for Christ. You read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When people take abuse for their faith and don't back down, that sends a positive message that what they believe must be true. There's a saying in church history that goes like this. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, the greater the persecution of the believer, the faster the church grew. Isn't that strange? You think it would be just the opposite. Yes, it may seem strange to hear the testimony of those who were martyred for their faith. Take, for example, the martyrdom of Polycarp, bishop of the church at Smyrna. That would be in Turkey today, Asia Minor then. He was probably the last surviving person to have known the apostle John, having been a disciple of John. He served food to those Roman soldiers who came to arrest him. Those soldiers then whipped him to shreds till his veins and arteries were exposed for all the time being asked to renounce Christ. He refused until finally they set him on fire. And while he was being consumed in the smoke and the flames, he uttered his final words. 
86 years I have served him, Jesus. And he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? I am certain that in spite of the pain and suffering from which a horrific way of dying would cause, Polycarp felt the presence of the Lord in that fire even as did the three Hebrew children who were cast into the fiery furnace by King Nebuchadnezzar because they would not bow to his golden statue. Even in death, these martyrs found their satisfaction in Jesus. And it's because of them and their staunch faith that the Holy Spirit was able to convict thousands upon thousands of Gentiles to come to the waters and be satisfied and your soul will delight in his abundance. So the first thing that we're looking at here, those first five verses, there's the invitation, come to the feast. God has placed all these delicacies out, and it's absolutely free. It's a sign of God's grace. And we are to delight in his abundance because we're going to find real satisfaction when we drink the water and eat the delicacies that he's laid out for us because there's satisfaction in knowing the grace of God. Now let's look at the second invitation in our text, verses 6 through 11. It's call upon the Lord. First we're to come to the feast, now we call upon the Lord. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Here's what it says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord for he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Not only is there an invitation to come to the Lord, there's a second and third invitation to seek him and to call upon him. There's a dilemma here that needs to be addressed. So we're going to get into a little uh, theology here, but what appears to be a contradiction in Scripture. Notice Isaiah says, seek the Lord. Now the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3 verse 11 says, there is none who seeks the Lord, or there is none who seeks after God. So the question is, how do we reconcile this seeming contradiction? Isaiah says, seek the Lord. Paul says, there is none who seeks after God. Well, the point that Paul is making in the context of that saying is that everybody is under sin. There's no exception. Then he quotes uh, from various Old Testament passages which speak of the very nature of a person under sin. They are not righteous. They do not understand God. They do not seek after God. They have turned away from God and they have become useless and sinful, he says. This is the nature of mankind. However, that does not mean that such a sinner under the conviction of the Holy Spirit cannot go against his own nature and seek after God. But it takes the work of the Holy Spirit before one is going to seek after God. Otherwise, no one is going to seek after God. Then writes Isaiah, you had better seek God, notice, while he may be found. Whoa. This implies there can come a time when God cannot be found. Hmm. When might that be? Sadly, one can become so engrossed in sin and his heart becomes so hard that God simply turns them over, notice, to the lusts of their heart and to their vile passions and to their debased mind. These are people so sinful that they are being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. 
Notice when one reaches that point in their sin life, where sin is such an habitual practice, it becomes a lifestyle, God gives up on them. He's nowhere around. These are people who are never going to call on the Lord, so there is no need for God to be near. There is every reason for him not to be near because he hates sin as well as the worker of iniquity. Yet for those who have not reached that state of sin, the call of the Lord is, let him return to the Lord. This is verse 7 of Isaiah 50. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now this next word is salute the Lord, for his thoughts and ways are superior to our thoughts. And ways. We're talking about calling on the Lord. We need to seek the Lord while he may be found. Now we need to salute the Lord for his ways and thoughts are higher than our ways and thoughts. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Here is a verse that we often use when we don't understand what God is doing. Problems come our way and we don't understand why God has allowed these distractions to come into our life. So we simply conclude, God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. It is that God is so above us in every way that there is no way of knowing what God is up to. Now, there may be some truth to that. I'm not denying that, but I don't think that's the primary understanding of those words. Here's what I think. What these verses are teaching us about God is the difference between him and you and me. We are sinful and he is holy. Therefore, he is telling us how much we need him. Look at verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. God is announcing through Isaiah because we need him in our life, his thoughts and ways are higher than ours. That is why he's offered this invitation to come to the waters. Come let your soul delight itself in my abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Seek me while I may be found. Call upon me while I am near. And what happens when one calls on the Lord? The Apostle Paul, quoting from the prophet Joel, said, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now there's a key word here. A key word, follow me now. It's the word whoever. The invitation notice is to whoever. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Here again is that word, whoever. In the Hebrew, it is the word that means the whole of something, all of something, or it means everyone. The idea being no one is to be excluded. In the Greek, it's the very same meaning. It's a word that means Everyone. What Jesus is saying in John 3.16 is everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now what's the point here? Everyone is given the opportunity for salvation. Follow me on this. We're going back and refuting Calvinism here. Everyone is given the opportunity for salvation. It is not a pick or choose matter for God. God does not have a chain of daisies in his hand, pulling off a pedal one at a time, saying, I love him, I hate him, I love him, I hate him, I love him, I hate him, every time a child, every time a child is born. You might have done that as a kid, but God doesn't do that. Salvation is not based on the arbitrary choices of God. It is based on man's choice. It is true that God knew our choices even before the foundation of the world. But still, the choice to come to God or to reject him is offered to everyone. 
we are to acknowledge that God's ways and thoughts are above our ways and thoughts. In every way he is holy and we are not. That is why we need to call upon the Lord while he may be found. But notice next. We're talking about calling upon the Lord. Calling upon the Lord. We need to seek the Lord while he may be found. We need to salute the Lord for his ways and thoughts are higher than ours. Now next, we need to study God's word for God will accomplish exactly what he says he will do. That's verses 10 and 11. Ah, this is a great section. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing that I sent it. There's a big difference between God's words and our words. When he speaks, something happens. It is like rain or snow that waters the earth and makes it productive. When God spoke the universe into existence, it was so. When God said, let there be light, it was so. When God said, let the firmament uh, be separated into the waters of the earth from the waters above the firmament, it was so. When God said, let there be a separation of waters on the earth to make for dry land, it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gatherings of the water he called the seas. When God said, let the earth bring forth grass, herb yielding seed and fruit trees of all kinds, it was so. When God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide day from night and let, there be, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years, it was so. When God made two great lights, the greater the rule the day and the lesser the rule the night, and he also made the stars, hey, it was so. When God said, let the waters abound with living creatures and birds to fly above the earth, it was so. When God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures, beasts, cattle, creeping things of all kinds, it was so. When God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and God created male and female, and not 72 other genders. When God made male and female, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, it was so. You talk about a powerful voice. God speaks, and what he speaks materializes. He speaks, and out of nothing the universe appears. God's powerful words have been put in writing by prophets, apostles, and holy men of God. We call it the scriptures or the holy Bible. His word is pure, true, perfect, precious, quick and powerful. It is God-breathed. It is eternal. It is designed to regenerate the sinner, to quicken the soul, to illuminate one's understanding of the things of God, to convert the soul, to sanctify the believer, to produce faith, to produce hope, to produce obedience, to promote growth and grace, to build up faith, to admonish, to comfort, to rejoice in heart. We are further told that to study the scripture brings the approval of God. There's nothing else we can do that scripture says makes us approved by God than to study the word of God. That's what we do in this class. So all of you today, when you leave, you're getting an approval from God for being here. <laughs> Isaiah tells us when God speaks, his words will not return void and they will accomplish what he pleases. It is because God is all knowing that he can reveal to us the future. He knows the beginning and the end of all things. He revealed the prophetic word that the northern kingdom would go into Assyrian captivity. And it was so. He revealed that Judah would be captured by Babylon. And it was so. He revealed a hundred years before King Cyrus of Persia was born that he, that he would utter a decree to allow the Jews to return to their homeland to rebuild the destroyed temple in, as well as the city of Jerusalem. And it was so. He revealed that the Jews would be scattered worldwide and persecuted wherever they went, but would return and become a nation again. And it was so. 
He prophesied that once back in their land that, they, that there would be wars with their neighboring neighbors. And it was so. He prophesied that in the end times there would be worldwide pandemics, wars and rumors of wars, natural disasters and apostasy, persecution of believers, out of control lawlessness, fear of signs in the heavens. For example, three asteroids came closer to hitting our earth in April of last year than any time in history. And now in recent times we have an explosion of more UFO sightings. Scripture also reveals there will be plans for a one-world government, borderless nations, a one-world currency, and a technology available to create the mark of the beast. All of these signs are to occur at the same time. Every one of these things is happening right now. These are all end-time signs staring us in the face today, and it is so. You see why it's such an urgent time for us to be ready? What's talked about least from the pulpits today is biblical prophecy. Yet it covers about a third to a fourth of the Bible. But it's totally ignored. Not in this class. Well, let's bring the final invitation. It's verses 12 and 13. The first invitation, come to the feast. God's got this banqueting table. He wants us to come and enjoy it. And we're going to delight in, in all of the abundance that he has there for us. And, and it's free. We don't have to pay for it. That's his grace. Then he tells us to call upon the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found, he says. Salute the Lord, for his ways and thoughts are higher than our ways and our thoughts. And study God's word, for God's will is set forth there, and whatever he says, he's going to accomplish. Now, here's the final invitation. Come to the feast, call upon the Lord. Now, celebrate with singing. Notice verse 12. Go forth with joy and be led in peace. That's how I want you to leave here today in about 10 minutes. I want you to go forth with joy and I want you to be led in peace. Okay? For you should go out with joy and be led out in peace. Verse 12. Isaiah opened this chapter with an invitation. Come to the waters. Water is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. At the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus took before uh, Jesus stood before the crowd and said, If any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, when those believing in him would receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I had a bite of that chili that they were serving out there, and it's not reacting too well. <laughs> you can blame my wife because she wanted me to finish up what she would need. <laughs> what I want us to do is look into the background concerning these words of Jesus, because this is kind of interesting. The Feast of the Tabernacles was a seven-day festival according to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 36. But by the time of Jesus was an eight-day celebration. It was for the Jews to remember how God took care of the children of Israel while they wandered in the wilderness before they reached the sudden life in the Promised Land. During the festival, booths sprang up everywhere. They, they still do this in Israel to this day. They were not to be permanent structures, but were built only to celebrate the occasion. These huts were made of branches and fronds and built in such a way that they would give protection from the weather, but not shut out the sun. The roof had to be thatched, but the thatching had to be wide enough for the stars to be seen through the roof at night. The historical significance of all of this was to remind the people that once upon a time, their forefathers had been homeless wanderers 
in the desert without a roof over their heads. This feast had also an agricultural significance to it. It was a harvest Thanksgiving festival and was sometimes called the festival of harvest. So the, the feast of tabernacles or the festival of harvest is referring to exactly the same thing. It's two different names. Of all the Jewish festivals, this was the one most popular. The prophet Zechariah tells us it is the one festival that will be celebrated all over the world during Christ's millennial reign. You see that in Zechariah chapter 14. Historian Josephus called this the holiest and greatest festival among the Jews. Now, there was a particular ceremony connected with this festival. Each day, worshipers were to bring to the temple of fruit, palm branches, boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. The people would form a line and place the palm and willows over their heads. So they're putting them over their heads, forming a roof as they marched around the brazen altar of the temple. At the same time, a priest who had taken water, three pints of water, from the pool of Siloam, and he did so in a golden pitcher. He carried the water to the altar of the temple as the people quoted Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. They also sang the Hallel, that is the Psalms of Praise from Psalms 113 to 118, accompanied with flutes of the Levitical choir. This they did as the priest poured the water over the altar as a drink offering to God. Now, it was against this background. If you get a picture of what's going on now, it was against this background on the last day of the feast that the voice of Jesus rang out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit. What Jesus was saying is, come to me if you want water that will forever quench the, thir the thirst of your soul. Jesus was using that dramatic moment to turn people's attention to the thirst of men for God and for eternal things. Then he identifies the water that quenches men's thirst as the Holy Spirit, who will come and indwell all believers in Christ after he is crucified, resurrected, and glorified by his Father through his ascension into heaven. When one accepts God's invitation to call upon the Lord and to come to the waters, then his soul will be fully satisfied and he will have reason to sing and celebrate for you shall go out with joy and be led out with peace. So we're to celebrate with singing. Go forth with joy. Be led out with peace. Now notice next. Gain the benefit of his blessings with praise. This is the latter part of verse 12, the first part of verse 13. The mountain shall break forth into singing before you, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn, there shall come up the cypress tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. Isaiah is promising a day when all nature will celebrate. It is because of Adam's sin that a curse was placed on all God's creation. The whole universe is subject to the law of entropy. That is, every created thing, every plant, every animal, and every person has a lifespan. And the day will come when all God's creation will be no more. But a new creation is coming. That's the good news. Paul addresses this in Romans when he writes how the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of God who subjected it in hope. Because the creation also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and, and uh, groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. See, we still live in a body of sin. This is this is flesh. 
and the flesh is capable of sin. But the day is going to come when we're going to get a glorified body. And that body is incapable of sin. But what we live in now, what we live in a, in a period of time known as it's entropy, it's, it's where everything is decay. I mean, look at yourself in the mirror and you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, stars burn out, the sun is burning up, plant life withers, animals get sick and die, and so do humans, but the promise of God is there is going to be a new creation, a new heaven, and a new earth where plant and animal life will be delivered from the curse of Adam. And those of us who come to the waters and call upon the Lord and drink from him, the living water will never thirst again. It is then that mankind will, in the coming kingdom, have redeemed and glorified bodies that are no longer subject to sin or sorrow or suffering or sign or crying or dying. Listen, that's worth shouting about. Ah, yeah. That calls for a celebration. In a metaphorical sense, all nature will celebrate with us as even the mountains and the hills will break forth in song and the trees will clap their hands what a day that's going to be. And that's basically what the rest of the book of Isaiah is about. Especially when we get to chapters 60 through 66. It's going to teach us about our life in the millennium. Oh, that's a great, great section. I can't wait to get there. Well, let's look finally at the latter part, latter part of verse 13. I am not happy with this at all. we got to find out how to... Everything new always creates more problems. Okay. Well, we talked about the, the need of celebrating. We're, we're to come and celebrate with singing. That is, we're to go forth with joy and be led in peace. We're to gain the benefits of God's blessing and praise because the future is bright now. Grasp the everlasting sign of God's promises. That's how this closes. We need to, there's a promise and there's a sign. And we need to grasp what that sign is as evidence of everything that he has said is true. And it shall come, or it shall be, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. The sign that God is going to remove the curse on man and all nature is to be seen in the transformed lives of all true believers in Christ. What does that say? It is seen in those who have come to the waters and are called upon and who call upon the Lord and are saved. These are the ones celebrating their new life in Christ. These are the people who have come to the Lord's banqueting table and have been fully filled and satisfied, who have drunk the living water offered by Christ and have digested the bread of life which he provides. The great invitation from the Lord is come to the feast, call upon the Lord, celebrate with singing. This is an invitation that God has extended to everyone as an act of his grace. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. So the sign is the transformed life of the believer. The fact that our lives are changed here and now through the Holy Spirit when we believe in Christ, when we come to the banqueting table and our lives are transformed, that is evidence that there's going to be even a greater transformation in the world to come. In the book published by Multnomah Press, The Day I Met God, is the story of the conversion of Johnny Lee Clary. He was raised by an alcoholic mother and a violent father who taught him nothing but how to hate. After his father's suicide and his mother's abandonment, Johnny found his new family and the local Ku Klux Klan. By age 14, he was raising, uh, rising in the Klan's ranks and set his sights on becoming Imperial Wizard, one of the highest positions in the Klan. One day, Johnny Lee had the opportunity to debate a black pastor, Wade Watts, on a local radio station with the idea of putting a black man in his place. 
The debate didn't go well for Johnny as he could not respond logically to Watt's biblical arguments. Furthermore, Watt continually told Johnny, I just want you to know that I love you and Jesus loves you. Johnny Lee and his fellow Klansmen began a campaign of harassment against Pastor Watts and his family. They threatened his life, that of his family. They broke out windows in his house and set fires to his church. Over time, Johnny Lee achieved his goal of being an imperial wizard of the local clan. But he could never get out of his mind how Pastor Watts responded to all the threats made against him and his family by reaching out to him in love. Johnny Lee became more and more abhorred by his own hatred and finally dropped out of the clan realizing this was not the way to live his life. For the next five years he wandered aimlessly not knowing what to do with himself. He was miserable. One night while contemplating suicide he picked up a Bible in the motel room. He was reading from the Gospels and he was convicted by the Holy Spirit. He knew he was a sinner and in need of a savior. That night he gave his life to Christ. He joined a multi-racial Bible church and began an intense study of the scriptures. It took him 10 years before he contacted Pastor Watts about his newfound faith. He was too embarrassed for how he had treated him and his family. He finally made the call and the pastor immediately recognized Johnny Lee's voice. He told the pastor that it was his godly attitude that eventually brought him to the Lord and that he was currently studying for the ministry. Pastor Watts invited him to speak at his church. Today, Johnny Lee Clary is Pastor Clary, an ordained minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ and CEO of a ministry called Color Blind Operations, Inc., a ministry of healing for those caught up in hatred, and substance abuse. <clears throat> Johnny Lee Clay accepted God's great invitation to come to the feast. He called upon the Lord and celebrated his newfound life with singing. It's the transformed lives of people like Pastor Clay that is God's sign to every believer that he redeems men today. As he redeems men today, he will redeem all his creation in a new world where Christ and his church will reign. The good news is you have been invited to the celebration. We've entitled this lecture today, Your Invitation Sent from God. An invitation to come to his festival of grace. While Isaiah never mentions the word grace, as I said earlier, it's all over this 55th chapter of Isaiah. It is by God's grace that Jesus paid the price for your sins and that God has invited you to his banquet. It is by God's grace that in Christ your soul is satisfied. It is by God's grace that you can be part of the Davidic covenant. It is by God's grace that you can seek the Lord and call upon his name. It is by God's grace you can know his thoughts and his ways as revealed in scripture. It is by God's grace that you can study his word and know of things to come for his word never returns to him void. It is by God's grace that one day you will have a redeemed body prepared to live in Christ's eternal kingdom. It is by God's grace that you will go forth with joy and be led forth in peace. I don't know about you, but I'm accepting his invitation to his banqueting table and enjoying the fruit from God's festival. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you join me at the banqueting table? Thank you.